Welcome, everyone, uh, to the annual Sarah Kaila Memorial Lecture at UC Berkeley. Uh, before I say another word, can I please ask you to silence your cell phones and or other buzzing devices through the duration of today's event? And that includes myself. Mine always goes off, so I can just done that. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Dr. Munis Faruti. I am the director of the Institute for South Asia Studies here at UC Berkeley. I am also a faculty member in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. I am truly honored to be standing here before you today. I am honored because over the past many years, my life has been vicariously but repeatedly touched by the kindness of Sarah Kailath, her family and her friends. This association began in 2010 when I sat in on my first Sarah Kailath Memorial Lecture in Chevron Auditorium. Here I got to listen to a future president of the United States. She expounded her vision for criminal reform, a fair shake for undocumented immigrants, and how can I forget, the impact of her Indian-born Tamil mother on her life. Yes, I'm referring to our now junior senator from the great state of California, Gamba Harris. Since then and over the years, thanks to the extraordinary generosity and far-sightedness of the Kaila family and their friends, I've been repeatedly educated by the annual Sarah Kailath Memorial Lectures on everything from water activism in India, international diplomacy in an age of growing xenophobia, the place of philanthropy in an age of new wealth disparities, and the craft of storytelling in both cinema and theatre. Most recently, my gratitude to Sarah Kailath has taken an even more robust but personal tone with my appointment as the director of the Institute for South Asia Studies. You see, along with the position comes an endowed chair. And so, among other titles, I'm now also the Sarah Kailath Chair of Indian Studies. Trust me when I say this, there isn't a day when I do not remember or invoke the name and memory of Sarah Kailath. The remarkable thing, however, is this. I never met Sarah Kailath. I wish I had, because from all accounts, she was a remarkable woman. Although Sarah Kailath was born in a small village in Kerala in 1941, with few expectations for her future success, she managed to develop, despite or perhaps because she had five older brothers, something that became a hallmark of her life, an independent, no-nonsense, can-do spirit. It was precisely these traits that enabled her to earn a BA in English literature. It led to her marriage to a certain Tom Kailath, despite, and this is a crucial fact, his lack of Malayalam, and allowed her to successfully raise four children in the South Bay, while simultaneously getting a BA in education, teaching in public schools, and finally becoming an entrepreneur in her own right. It's precisely Sarah Kailath's independence, no-nonsense, can-do spirit that led her to first travel the world, educating herself on the way, and then forming a charitable trust dedicated to the education and uplift of women in India after she was diagnosed with a rare cancer in 2003. Sarah Kailath passed away almost 10 years ago. Sarah Kailath passed away far too young. But her capacity for empathy, generosity, kindness, and philanthropy are alive and well and certainly here at UC Berkeley, actively recalled and honored. Which brings me, almost, to finishing. Although it is not my privilege to introduce the brilliant and redoubtable Malika Sarabai, I'm thrilled to say a few words about the person who will be her interlocutor tonight, Professor Raka Ray. Professor Ray holds three, yes, three appointments at Berkeley. Although her primary department is sociology, she is also a faculty person in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies and the Department of Geography. 
Beyond an extraordinarily high threshold of pain for lots of administrative and committee work, <laughs> these appointments, I believe, attest to Professor Ray's remarkable intellectual breadth and her superlative scholarship. Professor Ray's interests are best exemplified in such intervention books as Fields of Protest, which focused on the intersection of women's movements and political fields in Kolkata and Mumbai, and Cultures of Servitude, co-authored with Simi Payum, which examined how class and gendered inequality gets produced and reproduced on a daily basis within the private world of the household. Beyond these two books, Professor Ray has also edited or co-edited three volumes, and they respectively have focused on social movements in India, the study of gender in India, and the role of middle-class cultural dominance in undermining Indian democracy. I'm honored to call Professor Ray a deeply respected colleague and a very dear friend. After Malika Sarabhai's lecture and conversation this afternoon, this evening perhaps, I've been told that Anu Luther will address a few words to you on behalf of the Kailath family and their friends. For now though, please join me in welcoming Professor Raka Ray to the stage. Thank you so much, uh, Munis, and welcome to your first grand event as the director of the Institute for South Asia Studies. The Sarah Kailath Memorial Lecture Series honors women leaders, women who have by virtue of their strength, talent, grit, and commitment, transformed themselves and at least a little bit of the world. We've had, as Munis said, women politicians, NGO activists, philanthropists and film directors, and today's Sarah Kailath lecturer will show us how one can transform the world through dance. Malika Sarabhai was born, as is well known to all, I think, to parents both renowned in their own right. Her father was scientist and innovator Vikram Sarabhai, who is considered to be the father of Indians, the Indian space program. Her mother was the legendary dancer, choreographer and social worker Mrinalini Sarabhai, who was in turn the sister of Lakshmi Sagar, commander in Netaji's Indian National Army. One does not normally introduce a speaker through her family. Indeed, earlier this week at Berkeley, Rahul Gandhi faced, I believe, many <laughs> tough questions about his. <laughs> but there are dynasties and there are dynasties. <laughs> One must, I believe, come to Malika through hers. The Sarabhais are a family deeply conscious of their heritage, which involves, across generations, a deep commitment to making India live up to its promise as a nation. To continue the tradition, Malika's son, Rivanta, is here with her today, continuing the Sarabhai legacy. Rivanta heads the art education and uh, training activities at the Darpana Academy of Performing Arts, which Malika has directed for over 30 years. I was reading a lovely interview with three generations of uh, Sarabhai women uh, today, Mrinalini, Malika, and Malika's daughter, Anahita, where they talked about supporting each other to be whom they wanted to be or could be, and about they talked about educating each other. In it, Malika tells the story of an aunt, Malika's aunt, who escaped on the day of her marriage, out of the bedroom window, climbing down a mango tree. <laughs> and I thought about how wonderful it is to be part of a family, a family conversation in which everybody delighted in the aunt's escape. <laughs> okay now, back to Malika Sarabhai, whom one could describe as one of India's leading choreographers and dancers, or as an actor, or a writer, or as an activist who uses dance to create social change. In her own words, Malika Sarabhai says that she is a communicator who uses dance, choreography, acting, and writing as different languages in which she communicates. She has been, as I said, the director of the Dharpana Academy of Performing Arts for many years, but she also has an MBA from IIM Ahmedabad and a PhD in organizational behavior from Gujarat University. She first 
came to international notice when she played the role of Draupadi in Peter Brooks's The Mahabharat for five years, first in French and then in English, performing in France, North America, Australia, Japan, and Scotland. It is clear even then that in interpreting Draupadi for Peter Brooks and Jean-Paul Carrier, um, the writers and, and, and directors, she was educating them and us all on the importance of thinking about powerful women in culturally specific ways. She played Draupadi as Shakti, chiding Peter Brooks, who avoided scenes such as the one in which, if you remember your Mahabharat, Draupadi fulfills her pledge of washing her hair with Dushashana's blood. She says, he thought it was too gory. I told him that he shouldn't have chosen the script if he didn't want to depict those scenes. <laughs> But before then, and since then, Malika Sarabhai has been dancing, creating productions, writing and acting. Since her 1989 work, Shakti, The Power of Woman, Malika has created numerous stage productions which have raised awareness of justice, of issues of justice and injustice. Rape, selective sex, uh, sex selective abortions, and more, through interpretations of classical Hindu mythology, interpretations of Sita, Savitri, and of course, Draupadi. She performs for audiences around the world, like ours, and she performs for rape victims and for tobacco farmers. And she does not seem to be slowing down. Of her many awards, the Sangeet Natak Academy Award, the Knight of the Order of uh, Arts and Letters from the French government, and the Padma Bhushan, she says they matter only for about five minutes, and then she's back to doing yoga for an hour every morning, rehearsing for four hours a day, or walking just a mere eight to 10 kilometers if she doesn't manage to rehearse that day. And when she is not doing that, she is performing and reminding the world that social change and aesthetics can and should go together. Please join me in giving a warm birthday welcome to Malika Sarva. She said, I have spent the entire day getting into your head. <laughs> and now I don't know how to introduce you because I am part of your brain. <laughs> um, which is daunting to say the least, but uh, I'm, thank you for that introduction. You know, I grew up watching my mother dance and rehearse. And my parents believed that they shouldn't build institutions, buildings, till whatever work they were doing outgrew the house and a building was required. So as I was growing up, we would come back from school and we couldn't get to the dinner table because there was a class on. And you couldn't go up to the bedroom because on the terrace there was another class on. The constant sound of <coughs> is what was the sound of my life. And I thought, this is too much hard work. I can't do this. But every single little girl I knew when I was five went to my mother's dance class, so there was nobody to play with. <laughs> so out of sheer frustration, I started learning dance. But the one thing I knew all through my life was, I don't want to be a professional dancer. I don't have the physical stamina and the grit for it. It's too much work. But I remember watching my mother's rehearsals and seeing her talk of Dalits being butchered, of this tragedy in a village called Ranmanipur when I must have been about 10. And this, I mean, my skin still crawls. It was a piece with no sound, with just people with sticks walking down. And there was no real hitting anybody. But what it evoked was so strong. And then another piece in 1963,
where she used Bharatanatyam, which is a, a form that talks of love, it talks of togetherness with the deity, it talks of Shingara, beauty. And where she used the, the spoken syllables of the drum, which are neutral, where she used these syllables as a language that was not limited to whether you spoke that language or not, but she used it to talk about what we now know as dowry killings. She was from the south, married into Gujarat, didn't speak a word of Gujarati, and Papa got her a friend, a writer, to teach her Gujarati, and she used to learn Gujarati from the newspapers. And she started reading about young brides in the villages of Gujarat, especially Saurashtra, jumping into the well, often with their little babies. And she couldn't figure this out because she had never heard of it in the South. And then, asking around, she got to know that this was because of this pressure of bringing in more money from your parents to fulfill the husband's wish to build a new well or at that time to get a cycle or whatever. And she was so horrified by this that she created this piece. And I still remember as a very young girl listening to this. And it just completely transformed me. Except that I thought that all artists did this. I grew up thinking this was what the arts was for. And believe me, it was an extremely rude shock to finally discover that my mother was a very rare exception who was using her art to talk about whatever bothered her. And I thought, that's very strange. And it was not till much later when I did become an artist. When I did the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata was in some senses a, a turning point for me. I went into the Mahabharata, this very celebrated young Bharatanatyam Kuchipuri dancer um, who had done lots of theatre but never professional theatre, who had done lots of films, um, and somebody who from the age of 10 in school had been fighting for the rights of anybody I thought was being badly treated. My school was run by an aunt, not the one who climbed out of the window, uh, but another aunt who brought Montessori education to India. And uh, it was a remarkable school, the maximum people number. I have a young, a then a young friend, Tia Stoller, who I haven't seen in 47 years, and she and I were in the same school together, and I haven't seen her since Tia, I remember Shreyas. Uh, so it was this remarkable school where there was no gender difference. We all did carpentry, we all did music, we all learned how to sew, we all had learned how to cook. Uh, I was the only girl in the hockey team. Uh, nor was there any religious difference, nor was there a caste difference. So these were all complete mysteries to me when I was thrown from Shreyas into St. Xavier's College where a hundred students in a class and everybody was asking, who do you know on the board? Meaning, who will get you a first class? Uh, that sort of thing. But so I went into the Mahabharata, somebody who fought for rights, I didn't know the word activist, somebody who fought for people's rights and put her foot into her mouth all the time, and a Bharatanatyam dance. And I was terrified. Because everybody else on the cast, and 22 people from 22 countries, all sort of, you know, we are professional actors. You, you've never done professional theatre? No. But I am Indian. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there was an advantage and a disadvantage. Anyway, we started, uh, we started rehearsals. I knew no French. We started rehearsals. I started learning French. I would get very exasperated in these rehearsals. My son was three weeks old when I joined the Mahabharata. So I always tell the story that I had my son on one side and a Tam Bram coffee maker in my hand and I traveled the world with these two things. Uh, and it was about five months through the rehearsals that we started previews. And I was completely lost. I didn't know what I was saying to my husbands. And I was just sort of literally mimicking the words. And I kept saying to myself, you know, if I forget a line, what am I going to say? And I said, I'll say it's something in Sanskrit. Nobody will understand. <laughs> so I was one night standing at 
the Gare du Nord um, subway station. It was very late at night. And across from me, on the other side of the platform, were two very chic young girls in mini skirts smoking away. And suddenly I heard, excuse me, my Madame Tropadi. I said, hello? <laughs> and they said, Madame Tropadi, c'est vous, no? So I said, yes. And basically what they said was that they were both in the Sorbonne. They didn't believe in feminism. They didn't believe in women's liberation. But they wouldn't mind being a woman like Draupadi. <laughs> that was OK. And over the next few years, as we traveled the world, I discovered the effect that Draupadi's character was having on very, very different women. I mean, big black women in Harlem would come and pat me on the shoulder. Aboriginal women in Australia, these very swelled women in Scotland and, and, and Scandinavia and so on. And I thought, one character, interpretation of one single woman can get across to so many women and say something in their heart. I have to get out and I can't go back to dancing Bharatanatyam and talking about Krishna and waiting for you, when will you come, when will I be united with you? <laughs> That's really not what I want to talk about. I have to create my own work, and I have to do what I have to do, and there's no better way of cutting through people's walls. Walls of, oh, I don't want to talk about X, Y, or Z. You know, I know all about that. Thank you very much. You know. How do you get through? Because prejudice starts from that. Prejudice starts from our having cordoned ourselves off. In our community, we do this. In our family, we do this. In our so and so, we don't believe this. How do you cut through? And I decided to use my, into quote, stardom to entice audiences to come and see me. And then came the whammy. Because I was talking of things they would never want to talk about. And as my work developed, I decided that I wanted to use dance, but I wanted to use more. So there were some things that needed theater, there were some things that needed a martial art, there were some things that needed me to be comical or ugly or use masks or puppets. So my work from 1990 basically broke these barriers and I started by saying, what do I want to say to them and who is it that I want to say it to? So all the work since 1990 following in my mother's footsteps of already using the arts, has really been driven by what I have to say to people <coughs> and who I'm saying it to. Is it to slum women that I'm talking about diabetes or breastfeeding? Is it to all the Supreme Court judges of the South countries that I'm trying to sensitize on gender? Is it to parliamentarians? Is it to college-going students in elite institutions in India who we think are the great new wave of leaders who are going to lead India to a glorious future and who know nothing beyond the great choice between whether to buy Adidas or Nike? <laughs> and all the work we have done has been in this. Since 2000, we've been using television more and more. Because whereas as a performer, I can reach maybe 20,000 people, television and film is really the core of reaching out. And having been on my father's lap, when the first television show, Krishi Darshan, was ever filmed in India, and seeing the complete wonder on the faces of the villagers who saw themselves on this little screen in a black box and having followed what is known as the site experiment, the satellite instructional television, which is legendary in the field of educational television anywhere in the world, I always grew up knowing the power of cinema and television. So a lot of our work has been using this. And I'm going to share some of the work. We work on many different levels. One is when I go and perform to unsuspecting audiences who come and think I'm going to do a nice Bharatanatyam show and I suddenly put in a feminist twist to it or gender twist to it. So that's regular audiences, ticket paying audiences, um, unsuspecting people like you. Uh, 
whatever. That's one level. The second is when we use the most popular genres of television, quiz, interviews, fiction, music videos, to again talk about the same issues, gender, injustice, environment, violence, all of these. Is there anything else left? Probably not. I think we've got the world's problems covered. <laughs> uh, we then use actors, trained actors, make them into actor activists. So train them in a particular subject. For instance, suppose we are working with diabetes or HIV. We work with doctors and researchers. Get the actors to understand a certain level of the nitty gritty of, uh, of, of, the, of the subject. And then create a performance that can then, in the case of HIV, go to every port in Gujarat repeatedly with a new performance talking of a new aspect of HIV for, for a 12 month period. So that's the third level where we take actors but we make them into actor activists. The fourth level is where young people from villages volunteer to train as peer educators. So they come just because they want to do something for society. And we work with them and train them to draw cartoons, to create songs, to write lyrics, to create little couplets, to empower them to go back to their village and deal with whatever it is that needs dealing with. And the fifth level is when we actually go into, for instance, Jharkhand or Rajasthan, and we want to work with, Rivanta, don't go, I'm about to take. Uh, uh, where we want to, for instance, we worked with USAID and the Bloomsburg School in Jharkhand three years ago. They had a 10-year deal with the Jharkhand government to bring down population levels, to bring down fertility levels, and for nine years didn't succeed, and then suddenly decided that poster campaigns and lectures and doctors going in wasn't helping, maybe they should do something else, so they came to us, and we went in and we asked for folk performance. And we auditioned folk performance groups doing their own stuff in three different languages, including a language called Ho. Uh, and then we trained them in each of their individual languages. We wrote a script with them, heard their music, put new words to their music, and created performances that we then set up in vans so that every day, three vans in three different <coughs> districts would go out in their own language. They would go in the afternoon, they would announce there's going to be a performance <coughs> under such and such tree at such and such time. They would go and they would set up something and they would perform. And one of the things, and Ramanda's going to really show the Jharkhand script in a second. Uh, one of the things we did is that India has a primary health worker system of women, called the Asha workers in most places. But in most places, nobody takes them very seriously, and they lack confidence. So we, in our script, had an Asha worker, and in each village, went to the actual Asha worker and trained her for two hours so that she became the Asha worker in the performance, and got introduced to the villagers, who immediately connected her with that group that had come, so she's the person to go to. And USAID did a study two years after this project and found that 90% of people remembered the script, remembered the messages, and a good 60% had actually approached the ASHA worker to convert to one or the other form of family planning. Now that's the kind of statistical work we do and that's the kind of village work we do. I will just ask Revata to show you just a little bit of how we worked in Jharkhand. Do you want the lights on? So it's the story of two families, one with six kids and one with one. Malaria. These are tribal groups who are talking about gender issues.
that's really the absolute grassroots level work. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of our television work. We did an environment, you know the environment has been a subject in Indian schools for many, many years, and it remains a subject in the book. Nobody relates to it actually. And we are convinced that if we can empower each child to become a change agent, then things will change. And we ran a project called Jagruti, which means awakening, with 50 municipal schools. Now the municipal schools are the poorest schools and the poorest children go there. Children who get bad drinking water, who get little rooms filled with smoke, and, and all that happens in, in a slum or in, in a poor district here in the United States. And we thought that if we could go and get them to understand that they could actually do things, uh, it might make a change. So we would go with a performance. The school year starts in June, July, which is monsoon, which means all the monsoon-born diseases. And we would divide the class, and part of the class would go and try and figure out where the municipal water is coming from. Another part of the class would go to families within their own communities and figure out where the water comes from and what is, how much time is spent in getting that water. And the third group in the school was asked to monitor the school water and say, so one night at 9 o'clock, I get a frantic phone call from one of the school principals. And he said, find me a plumber. So I said, at 9 o'clock at night? He said, my children have get out of me. They've been telling me that there are taps leaking and I've not been able to fix it. And now they won't go home. <laughs> and another day, same project, I was driving down Ashram Road, which is like the main road of Ahmedabad. used to be the main road of Ahmedabad. And a policeman flags me down. And I said, I haven't done anything. And he sticks his head in and said, Madam, you have completely turned my life upside down. I said, what happened? It's both my children are in your project, and now when I'm shaving, they say, why don't you turn the tap off? Mm -hmm. When my wife is washing the vegetables, they are telling her that the vegetables are cleaner without the water she's using. She must do something to boil the water and so on. So here we had 2,800, 3,000 kids who suddenly felt empowered to do something. They had the knowledge, they had the information, and to do something. But to take this manifold further, we decided to go on television. And I work in Gujarat, and Gujarat has a great disadvantage that it's one of the states where English is not a particularly strong language. As a result of which, Gujarati children rarely get into any kind of competitive fun nationally. So we decided to go in Gujarati to the children and had a quiz competition called Srishti, which means um, creation. By the time we did the fourth edition, there were 8,000 schools participating. And this is the result. These are the first uh, tests that we went and took in 10 centers and the qualifying teams then go on to the next level. But these are areas of Gujarat that nobody goes to. These kids never have a chance to actually show their skills or show their talents. So every time we made the, the whole thing appear something that everybody wanted to be on, it became the most popular children's program in Gujarat. Thanks, 
What was very interesting was that in most competitions, one would think that the urban schools, the very good schools, would win. But we had very practical rounds. So for instance, we had leaves that we eat, and we had seeds that we eat, and people had to connect the leaf with the seed. And of course, not a single one of the urban elite could, but a grocer's son from a tiny village matched everything and won that round. But it was this kind of discovery uh, that was very interesting for us. Also, there is a certain glamour of being on television, and these children had that opportunity because the quiz went on once a week for 14 weeks. And we had schools, entire schools, uh, watching these, and teachers coming and saying, please give us all your quiz questions because we would love to teach children this way. So we found the power of television, and I have an author friend who is an Indologist called Stephen Heiler, who teaches in Maine, and he sent me a picture once of a border village between Kutch and Pakistan where suddenly all the children disappeared and there was one television station. He wanted to see what it was. And all the children were crowded around watching Srishti and he sent me this delightful picture of all the kids like this with us on television. So that's the power of television. Devanta, what else do we have on television that... South Church. Okay. In 2005-06, I approached the central government. And I said that with the number of satellite channels that are coming up, nobody is actually watching the national channel Doordarshan. And yet Doordarshan has the possibility of transforming this country. You are in 22 languages. You have earth stations everywhere. You need to approach programming differently. So can you give me the money for one year to be able to show you what Gujarati television can do and how inclusive and participatory television can be, rather like the whole ham radio thing that happened in the 50s and 60s here. So we called the channel Sat, which means truth, and the central government, after three years of discussion, gave us the project for one month. And this is a chat show uh, from there, which for the first time brought all the players onto one field. So for instance, a lot of children are going through severe mental depression and stress because of the expectations their parents have of gold medals and coming first and so on. Teachers say the parents are pressure. The students say we feel pressure from everywhere. Parents say we don't do anything, the school wants better results. But there is never a conversation. So we had school students, we had professional teachers, we had parents, and we had a panel of a psychologist and educationist, and depending on what the subject was, a third person. And for the first time, they could actually speak to each other, because it was not my parents I was arguing with. I was, I was talking on behalf of all of us to another set of parents. And it was quite remarkable. I'll tell you one particular example. The government had just passed a law that all rickshaws, tuk-tuks, had to go into green energy. So Bajaj Auto, which is one of our biggest auto manufacturers, had been given the mandate to help change the, 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 the machines the, from fuel to CNG. And the State Bank of India had been told to give the loans to the rickshaw drivers without having to put family money or jewelry or anything as a as an assurance and this was not happening so we got these three together the state bank of india who wouldn't normally talk to the rickshaw drivers and bajaj who didn't have a clue and on stage while the shooting was going on i called mr bajaj up and i said mr bajaj i have people here who are accusing your dealers of trying to make a fast buck in collusion with the state bank of india and I'm here with a live audience, what do you have to say about it? <laughs> and he said, I will look into it. And I said, on my next show, I'm going to come back with the same. And the problem was solved. The next morning, the state bank officials came to apologize. They wrote in the newspapers that they found these kind of misgivings and sorted it out. This was the power. Unfortunately, after one month, the government decided it was far too risky and shut us down. But here is one of those shows. I 
This is about young people watching porn on mobile phones. This was one of our most famous gynecologists. He said that in the first day of marriage, he was born in Malika. He said that he was born in Malika. He said that he was born in Malika. But in the first day of the day, he was born in Malika. He said that 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 he was born in Malika. अत्याचार कारण के आपने मैरिज का पहला दिवस थी ओपन स्टेटमेंट करिए चाहिए कि बहने तो नाम बदली ना कौन कि बहनों ने तूत के आवाज़ मुझे है कि तम्हें थोड़ी की हिम्मत दे दो पुलिस वेबर स्पीकर ऑफ हैरिसमेंट फ्रॉम मेल क्लीक कि जेक तमारी ये भी कि इमेज उठी था इन्हें तम्हें तमारी प्रोतानो जेक so our logo was Gandhiji's three monkeys except they say we have to hear we have to listen and we have to shout from the rooftops when something is wrong We were talking about women violence, so I'm going to take a break and call my two colleagues, Pooja and Hemvati. We're going to show you a small piece um, which is called Anti-Clockwise. And we will be performing it tomorrow. Uh, this stage, we might fall off it, but we will show it to you anyway. Even if my eyes become the soles of your feet Oh, 
the casualty list goes on. Does anything really change? Is anything really different? Now I am a daughter of my rage. I am a daughter of my love. I am a daughter of myself and have as much right as anyone to the bounty of the world. Now I hold my own hands from the inside. Now the flowering of acceptance, the fire of the challenge, the vision of freedom. Even if my eyes become the soles of your feet, this fear will not leave. Even if my eyes become the soles of your feet, this fear will not leave you. extraordinary colleague of mine, she's British Pakistani, her name is Samia Malik, and in the late 90s I used to perform a lot in Britain and at Neural Knowledge University I saw this woman who looked like a Pathan woman sitting for four years, every year I'd go back and I'd see her, the fourth year she approached me and she said, my name is Samia Malik, and I said I've been noticing you every year, and that's how we began to collaborate, she's an extraordinary woman who moved away from Pakistan to live in Britain and understands the culture that we bring. Uh, so, Samia, wherever you are, Salam. We have also, I have taken the classical form of Bharatanatyam. In the repertoire, it is the, the Padam and the Varnam and, and so on. And seen how within the classical form of the absolute classical tradition, the way the swaras are, the way the you know the, the, the order in which the syllables come and then the lyrics come and then the notes come and so on and so forth. How I could write for myself within the same context, within the same alphabet. And I'm asking Revanta to show you a traditional song to the Trinity of Gods, Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva. But what do we have to say to them today? Do we have subtitles around that? Okay. Another thing we have started doing over the last few years is that I started subtitling the shows. Because I feel that even in India, most people don't actually understand what is being sung. And that is such a disservice to what is being said. So this is how we normally do it. And this is a piece that I wrote for Revanta a couple of years ago to the Trinity of Gods. Is that legible? Yes. Thank you. 
உங்கள் சேவையை தேவையில்லை started creating new work within the classical repertoire is because I'm often told by fellow artists that classical dance is archaic. To me, the language of something like Bharatanatyam is so sophisticated that one can basically talk of anything. And I thought that if the pundits who had written the songs that we dance today were alive, they would not be talking of, Krishna, will you come and embrace me? They were wise people who spoke of their times. Perhaps their times were times where spiritual quests were the most important. We live in other times. And I think we have to be able to use whatever languages we have to draw attention to that. Thank you all very much. I could go on sharing work, but I think it's now time. <laughs> really? I would much rather throw it open and spend the next 45 minutes talking and telling people what they're interested in hearing. Okay. In, um, in 1991, after I had created my first one woman show, Shakti, the Power of Women, which spoke of how language and history marginalizes women, how a patriarchal society defines women as the weaker sex. They call them everything that is weaker in each language. So actor, actress, lesser, uh, and so on and so forth, whatever, in all languages. And for instance, a woman like Draupadi, if you look at an Indian mythological book, it will say daughter of so-and-so, wife of so-and-so, seduced by so-and-so, and so She has nothing. And so in Shakti, I took these women and uh, set them like statues with a guidebook reading and then the woman actually transforming into her point of view. And I took Draupadi and Savitri, in whose name as Sati, millions of women have burnt over the years in India. And then from medieval history took uh, Rani Lakshmi Bai or Jhansi and Mirabai. And then from current events took a woman in a village who had been draped and had actually moved court. And the huggers of trees, the Chipko movement. So when I took this around India, it was in English, when I took it around India, I had dozens of women's activists and groups coming to me and saying, you have to translate this into Hindi. And I said, this doesn't make sense. I understand that a piece like this needs to be done, but let's do a new piece. So I wrote to them and I said, if you were to try and transmit an idea or an issue, and were having difficulty with it. What were these issues? And they came back with things like land rights. And, but from all of what they said needed to be taken forward, there were things like female feticides, which were just starting in India. And there was rape, of course, and the, the stigma attached to rape. And because we live our mythology, and because to me, all our women mythological characters have been so made into travesties of what they must have been, I decided to take the one woman who is the epitome of Hindu India and is used to suppress more women than anybody else, and that was Sita. So I start with Sita's, and I call the piece Sita's Daughters, saying that these are women who have the courage to speak up. And Revanta wants me to show you an excerpt from Sita's Daughters. It was the first time that female feticide was being talked about. I sat and interviewed 40 doctors who did the sex determination test and who were completely aware that they were leading to female feticides. And this case study that I did was about one doctor who is different. I think that's the excerpt. Is that the excerpt? Which is the excerpt? 
You don't know. Okay. Anyway, so this is and this performance uh, I have done in English, Hindi, and Gujarati in 40 countries over 600 times. And unfortunately, it's still needed. Those of you who were at the Asian Arts Museum will recognize. Why is it so This was a, I was pregnant with my daughter at the time and I wrote a lullaby to her which has subsequently been translated into many languages and used as the school song for girls schools. Her father the king said, don't whistle. Her mother the queen said, hi Vidya, don't whistle. But the princess continued whistling. So let's see those daughters. <laughs> Two other excerpts that we'll show you. In 1996, I was working with a colleague in England, and this was the time when there were a lot of cases of six year olds shooting their sisters dead of uh, young children not knowing how to do a gun but looking at cartoons and dragging a younger sibling to a railway crossing and seeing a train pass over them and saying but in the cartoons they jump up again and we were horrified and violence is something that bothered me tremendously and we thought that you know everything that we talk about violence talks of it from the point of view of the victim but unless you understand the mind of the perpetrator you are never going to be able to tackle violence because all you feel is empathy. So I created a piece called V4 because I felt that V really was not for victory, it was for the one thing that connected the world, which is violence. And this is a short excerpt from that. Secretive, 
Meanwhile, the evil that they did not see would not hear. These are the three wives of the three monkeys, fed up that their husbands the don't do anything. The were tumbling down around their ears. So their three wives were fed up at their husband's stubbornness in not doing anything. The first one said, We must see the evil all around us. We must hear the evil all around us. And we must shout it to the rooftops. Only then will evil be laid bare. As we have seen, we use many forms, we use many formats. I'm going to end the session with a piece that we did three years ago called The Damned. I don't know if you know whether where that the largest number of internally forced migrated people are in India. And most of them are because of the dams we are building, because of the mining that is being done, and because of all the development works that are going on. And three years ago, in Madhya Pradesh, there was a set of villages which were to be flooded by one of the dams. And the villagers went and submerged themselves in the waters for 17 days without moving before the government took notice. The case is still going on, but we created a series of three pieces on forced migration and the, and the state in which these people live. And this is a piece we did called The Damned, and it was dedicated to the Jal Samadhi, the water barrier that these villagers went through. colony where 50 years ago itinerant artists were settled and they had just been thrown out uh, by a builder lobby and given tiny little hovels in a multi-story building and joining us at the end of that was this group of people who came in for the protest. You know 
My work can be seen as anti-government. It's not anti-government. It's anti-injustice. And a lot of my work has been used by different people in the government to sensitize others. Uh, an erstwhile chief minister of Maharashtra had me perform Sita's Daughters every year for all 400 magistrates and then discuss with them how their judgments could be more sensitive to women. Many of my pieces have been done for legislators or for police officials or for somebody in authority. And I would like to think that we can work both at the grassroots and at the policy making level. And that is what my endeavor has always been to work with a variety of people, people who can write about it, people who can be influencers, people who are educators, people who are actually at the receiving end or should be making changes. Thank you and now over to you. Thank you so very much, um, uh, Malika, for, uh, for your thoughts, for your grace, for your commitment. Um, I know we've actually, we started late so we don't have that much time so I'm not going to um, ask you all the questions I had. But I, I do want to lead off with just one question and then we'll open it up to the audience. And that is, I was reminded, you want to have a seat? I was reminded of uh, my youth when I was in the 1980s when I was a young feminist. We would go from, um, you know, with the women's movement from village to village. Uh, performing these skits, and you know, frankly, they were awful. You know, they were they were they were didactic. They were not at all artistic, but they were accessible, right? And so I've been really looking at this and thinking, if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between aesthetics and accessibility, uh, given what you do. Yeah, I think this is very very crucial, and I. Often, I work with a lot of NGOs in India and I often tell them, please don't murder theatre and dance. I think Dharpana has carved a unique place because we are primarily trained as artists. We know and understand the pulse of an audience. And what my philosophy has been is that you have to keep the bums on the seat. It has to be entertaining enough to keep the bums on the seat. Then if they agree or disagree, they've at least sat through it. So if they disagree with your point of view, they're already taking a stand. And I think the arts badly used are, are really something that can be awful. And that's why I try and reach out to other artists and say, please, you know, let's, let's train people. Let's train people who have their heads there in order that they can actually create something that's entertaining while subliminally be giving other things. And when do you decide to sort of absorb more folk or, or that this is a, do you think this is an audience that can understand classical or do you think that's the wrong question? Well, as I said, it's the topic and the end user that always for me determines which of these many strings of my tanpur I'm going to use. In Rajasthan, there is a very famous traditional painting, storytelling technique called the Pabuji Ka Bhad. And we have used it to talk of health issues, training the husband and wife who always do it, who no longer have an, uh, an audience, to be able to do these paintings on health issues and to tell stories and dance. And so there, I'm also giving a new lease of life to a folk art, which is very important because there are some extraordinary folk artists who are completely dying out because of television. So that, that determines. Let me um, see if there are questions from the audience. I know there will be. Um, Linda. Uh, so the kind of work you do, I'll try to be loud, the kind of work you do, uh, uh, I'll get your mic. it never got anybody mad at you or anything, did it? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a euphemistic question? <laughs> or put you in danger or... Yes to both. The less said about it, the better. I have had uh, attacks on the theatre and attacks on the academy. Oh. Can everybody please introduce themselves? Um, my name is Bob Goldman, a Sanskrit professor here at Malika Bank. 
क्या कहना जवाब नहीं बट लिंड क्वेश्चन इन सेंस बट आई वाज वनिंग बिकॉज ऑफ मीन हाउ डू रिस्पॉन्ड टू वट एवर नेगेटिव attacks you get or verbally or other what's your way that you handle that to kind of persuade people uh... and could i add just when i asked that question in a little bit droll fashion i the subtext of my question is to bring forward your courage in doing all of this and we see it as beautiful and noble and valuable but it's also very courageous and i should have maybe just said that right out you should introduce yourself in that i'm Linda Hess you met no no i know it's for everybody <laughs> times change even in the last 20 years 30 years that i've been doing it the world has changed so much it's gone from being tolerant of dissent to being lynch mobs and i think strategies need to change a lot of people thought i was anti this and anti that a few years ago for the 600th celebration of the city of amdavad we created a piece that brought together all the different strands of people communities countries that have contributed to amdavad becoming the city it is and in 600 years there have been islamic rulers and there have been jain rulers and there have been the dutch coming in the british coming in the french coming in the gujarati language exists today because of one britisher who said you can't not have literature in this language you can't have gujarati remain a language of accounts and together in the 1860s put together what we now know as gujarati but nobody knows this history so we put this show together and it became this super hit happening it ran for 35 days it could have run for a year with queues in amdavad a kilometer long and i had time and time again people who were on the opposite side of me in every which way come to me hold my hand and say we feel so proud to be an amdavadi and we misunderstood you we we really misunderstood you sir and i think the time is today to take in people to make them see a different point of view so the strategy has to change you can no longer be confrontations that's not the time you have to be able to make people understand that to be for betterment or to be for plurality is not to be anti individual or anti religion and i think a lot of my work has taken that change uh, to take it forward let us that answer your question as well yes i am pushatan bilimori also in part you remember um a product of gujarat university um You know, I've I've followed um, quite closely in some ways you know, your development. I I want to come to the diaspora. In the diaspora, there's a lot of emphasis on classical, as you, you know, classical Indian dance. But you know, beautifully done. In you know, 1957, classical dance was brought here by Lightfoot and Shivaram, Kathakali, and so on. But not much emphasis on what you um, what you uh, brought brought out. The tribal in 1992, I remember when I. This is a, you are actually exploring a huge array of travel, and then the, and then just went all over the country. It was so beautiful, and then the use of that in in a more activist in bringing out issues and so on. Is it that the tribal um, uh, and folk art, folk dances, lend more to expression from the street theatres and so on in the past, and the classical is just very classical and very aesthetic, uh, uh, and uh, and perhaps a bit stayed in that sense as well. But then you are transitioned to a more modern, and, and this is this is new to me now. You know, that the sort of the, the contemporary forms that you brought in, it's very expressive, very good. But what what about the travel and the folk, not just in the villages, but more widely as well, and in the diaspora? Well, there are two or three questions in that one question. I think the diaspora likes to stick. to three am notes that they can say this is india this is india this is india and we don't want to explore further 
Uh, so I was giving an example yesterday to somebody that uh, in certainly in all Gujarati families that I have seen, whether in Kenya or Britain or here, at Diwali they will be made to touch the feet of the elder. But how many of them actually know why the touching of feet is important and what it actually means? Why did my young colleagues touch my feet before they came on stage? It's nothing to do with me. I am just a vessel that at this point of time represents maybe a thousand years of artistry. I happen to be that senior vessel and what they are touching is the essence of that continuum. So if I say touch my feet because I say so, or because you respect your elders, it doesn't make sense. You're taking things completely out of contrast and you're putting them as museum pieces. And I find that a lot of what goes as this is Indian, you must do it. This is our Sanskrit, you must do it. Is A, Brahminical, B, upper caste, and C, completely out of context. Indians are tremendous snobs. Our Sanskritization process is continuous. So we look upon anything that is tribal as archaic, primordial, primitive, and we have convinced the tribals that their amazing, sophisticated, nature-loving culture is completely passé. So that they also are in the process of Sanskritization, trying to be like Shah Rukh Khan in that film. Same with our folk dancing. Our folk has become disco folk. I mean, look at the garbas that go around here. You dance to Bollywood music, and you've forgotten what is the garba about? What does the word garba mean? The garba is the garba. It's 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 the it's the seat from where a new life is born. And what does that circle mean? The circle is a continuation of the cycle of nature that is life. And the light in the middle is the new birth. How many people actually know it as the new garba? <laughs> so what I'm saying is, yes, we think classical is best. Classical is one of many stands. Does does pop music become less relevant because Beethoven is relevant? No, they all have their place. We valorize one because we have such deep insecurities about being anything else. So we in that one use a lot of popular culture, not Bollywood popular culture, it's but popular as in people's songs, people's dancing. Because by doing that and because we are seen as the elite, we are also backing their culture. So yes, we use a lot of that, we perform it a lot also to try and show people that it's not backward, it's in fact very, very forward. Tribal dancing, for instance, has no gender imbalance. In all Western dancing, the man leads and the woman follows. In Bharatanatyam, there used not to be men, so it didn't matter. But in tribal dancing in India, in autochthonous dancing, men and women actually exactly the same in the dance, as is a reflection of what they are in society. That's changing. The matriarchal system in the Garo tribes is changing because it's considered passé. What, what century do you live in? So, yes, we use whatever for whatever. Uh, the piece that Revanta did for you cannot be faulted for the authenticity, I hate the word, but authenticity of the Bharatanatyam repertoire. For me, it is important when I make a change to prove that I'm not doing it because I don't know the grammar, but because of the freedom that knowing the grammar in every cell of my body gives me. And only then do I have the possibility of changing it. If Arundhati Roy misspells words in God of Small Things or doesn't give spacing between words, she's not doing it because she doesn't know her grammar. So for me, it is very important to reach a young audience of Bharatanatyam dancers to say, hey, listen, even in the Bharatanatyam repertoire, this can be done. You can talk of environmental issues, you can talk of lesbian relationships, because the language is sophisticated enough. It's not an archaic language, so don't make it so. Last question. I'm very sorry, sir. Okay. Uh, sorry, may I ask something? No. So what 
Uh, my name is Purnima. I grew up in Kerala, and I learned dancing when you know as part of my as every little girl does. As all. But one thing I noticed when I was um, in Kerala is that none of my Muslim friends or uh, Christian friends ever did uh, any dancing. They didn't learn uh, to dance because all our uh, music and dance was all based on Hindu mythology. And they felt disconnected from you know, from the from that culture. So, what have you done to bring uh, music and dance to uh, to the Muslim uh, world and also to the Christians? Have you tried to integrate? I have not Christians? consciously done it, but uh, St. Xavier's Loyola, the, the the biggest Jesuit, commissioned us in 1980 to create an entire Bharatanatyam piece on the life of Jesus. And we didn't have very many men dancers, so all the novitiate men who were becoming brothers and fathers were trained by us into doing the life of Christ, which we then took around the country uh, with these men who are not supposed to even, even look at a woman, um, being pushed around by my mother and me, training them. So we have the life of Christ in Bharatanatyam, reaching out, taking the Christian songs in Gujarati, and it was called Snehana Shatadal, a thousand leafed lotus of compassion. And it was hugely popular. Uh, as you saw, the piece that we just did anti clockwise was about the Quran and, 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 and uh, Muhammad. So I don't really consciously do that, but I use whatever material I can get. And uh, we have Parsi and Muslim and Christian students. And I know at least two brothers who have created an entire repertoire in uh, with Christian songs, both of whom are Bharatanatyam dancers, they are, they are brothers. Uh, so work is being done. I don't consciously look at religion like that. So, so my Shiva is told to basically push off because we've done it all. So you know it's... I actually am very sorry, but we have to vacate the auditorium, I've been told, at 6. Uh, which is five minutes from now, so... Sir, I will come and answer your question as soon as this is over. It's not my question, please. Okay, fine. I have to say something because the last thing that I heard on this stage, thank you very much, I come from Andhavar, although I am from Mangalore. Thank you very much for the entire program. But the last words that linger in my mind is, Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, we don't want you anymore. That was said 2,500 years ago by the Buddha, by Mahavira. And that tradition remains alive even to this day in India. And divinity has been rejected again and again, again and again, again. Please, let that also be said when he said, there is no need for you now. We have rejected you long time ago. Thank, Thank you. you. And with that, I'd like to invite first Bunis and also um, Anuruddha Maitra. So I'll make this really, really short. Um, Anuruddha is going to say a few comments on behalf of the Kaila family and all the friends who are assembled over here today. And I just want to say, without uh, Anu's warm encouragement, support, and in some sense, his active participation in this series, uh, I really think that the Sarah Kailath uh, series would be um, much the poorer for it. So thank you, Anu, for everything. Well, it's hard to miss the fact that for Malika, there is an intimate and almost existentialist connection between her dance and her social activism on behalf of silenced voices and the choice of that adjective is very deliberate, silenced rather than unheard, because there is an underlying political statement there that I believe reflects her thinking. Um, but I also don't wish to minimize her art by saying that she's an artist who wants to do important things. Rather, I think that she wants to do important things, and therefore she's an artist. And this characterization, I think, is importantly relevant today 
because all over the world, with the spread of the internet, we are rapidly becoming a visual culture. A dance today is worth a thousand words. And on the theme of the series, Women in Leadership, what I find striking about Malika's uh, approach is that she always presents strong women adopting forceful measures and none of this, the hand that rocks the cradle, behind the scenes, quiet, even manipulative paradigm. To be leaders, I think, women need to be in front, out there, that is honest, open and assertive, even desirable, actually thus desirable. So, um, you know, Tom has a cold and so he asked me to speak on his behalf. But I think that in this context, I don't really need to apologize for taking the stage to say thank you to Malika uh, on behalf of my husband in an event that is in honor of his late wife. Um, but um, the theme of the series was my idea and this is going to be the century when aided by technology and activism and cooperation by men and governments, sometimes the same thing, uh, women will assume equal status in every way and Malika reminds us that we can joyfully dance our way through it. Tom and I will be there dancing with you, perhaps because it's because I was one of those five-year-olds who actually took dance lessons from your mother. I never mentioned this to you. And I don't know if you remember this, but at your uh, performance of uh, Sita's Daughters at the Asian Art Museum, after you finished, there was this hushed silence and then one man got up and started giving you a started a standing ovation, and that was Tom. Yes, I remember. No, you remember that? Okay. How could I miss that? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So, um, in closing, I just would like to thank this very impressive lineup of holders of the Sarah Kaila Chair that have kept the flame alive for the South Asia Institute. Um, and also being sort of tremendously supportive of the lecture series that started only a few years ago. So there's Bob Goldman here, and uh, I'd like to mention in that context that I just learned today that Bob has uh, just, it's just been announced that Bob is going to be the recipient of the World Sanskrit Award, which will be Thank given. <laughs> yes, wonderful. Congratulations, Bob. And um, Tom Metcalf and Raka Rai, who's here, and then there's Lawrence uh, Cohen. I saw him come in. Thank you. And of course, um, Monis Faruqi. So uh, thank you very much. Also, would like to um, thank um, Punita, who always does it. I don't know where you are, Punita, but you always do such a tremendous job. Uh, supporting this uh, particular lecture series. So thank you very much. And I should forget, actually I had in my notes, but thank you very much to your, um, uh, to Ravanta and to your two young colleagues. Pooja and Hemvati. Pooja and Hemvati. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. of Art Forum for their consistent belief in the work that I and that when I do and we'll bring us here. Thank you. Thank you.